Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Ryan Kahlo, who is uh, visiting us from the University of Washington, where he's a law professor. Uh, he's not just any law professor. He is one of those fancy endowed professors who has <laughs> someone else's name in front of his title. Um, and uh, he is the founder of not one, but two centers at UW. One is the Tech Policy Lab, which is an interdisciplinary center, which has a lot of similarities with CITP, and uh, the other one is the Center for an Informed Public, uh, uh, which leads the charge uh, in the fight against misinformation. And he's the co-founder of both of those centers with many other prominent scholars at UW. Uh, he is one of the leading people in the field of law and technology. He's written for two decades on many important topics, including privacy, robots, and AI. I have to say, Ryan, my favorite paper of yours is The Scale and the Reactor, mm. uh, where Ryan just spent a few years immersed in this field called science and technology studies, which I think is perpetually underappreciated by the rest of academia. <laughs> <laughs> and through <Drew's> lessons. Hi, Janet. Drew lessons from STS for law and technology as a place that values interdisciplinary scholarship. That kind of research, I think, really speaks to, to a lot of us here. Uh, Ryan is visiting CITP on and off this semester, so I hope you're able to take advantage of him being here for a few days this week. Uh, and I think this um, event being also a part of our uh, visit day programming, uh, welcome visitors. I'm, uh, I'm sure you will enjoy this talk. It, it is a weekly lunch seminar series, and it's intended to uh, showcase the best of the kind of interdisciplinary work uh, that we do here. Um, I won't read Ryan's full bio, but I hope you have a, a sense of uh, what he does. So over to you, Ryan. Thank you so much, Arvin. Yeah, I was just talking to Arvin about this is my third time uh, presenting here. Uh, the first one was about augmented reality. I do not recall what the second talk was about. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how long I've been doing this. But the third talk you, you'll see is about law and, and technology. Um, but I'm always delighted to be here. I really consider um, CITP to be, you know, um, just uh, absolutely um, one of the most uh, thoughtful, uh, deeply interdisciplinary, uh, impactful shops around. And so we think of your organization as being very much a sister organization, the Tech Policy Lab, and, and, and a common mission. So um, really happy to be here. I don't know if you know this, I was supposed to give this talk last month, and I got snowed out. Okay, awesome. like literally was here, and then they were like, nope, we're gonna close down Princeton, can't give your talk. Last week, I was supposed to give a keynote at HRI, which is Human Robot Interaction in Colorado. I show up, I'm in my hotel, freak snowstorm. Uh, they shut the whole campus down, and I end up having to do it from my hotel room. So <laughs> I'm concerned that perhaps like you're gonna get like Dobby, the house elf's gonna come out and say, "No, Harry, don't go to don't go to Hogwarts." You know what I mean? But um, hopefully, I will be able to actually give you um, um, uh, my presentation today. Um, so basically, um, I'm talking about a book project. Uh, this is a working title. It's probably not gonna be the ultimate title. It's with Oxford University Press. And it's about um, how law can approach emerging technology, okay, broadly speaking. Um, and I'm gonna talk about essentially uh, uh, three things. The first is I wanna talk about a concept I'm developing that I call technological incapacity. And you will recognize in your own disciplines and your own work <laughs> um, echoes of this, and, and hopefully you'll tell me where I can I can look to, to learn more about that. Um, but uh, technological incapacity refers to this kind of force field around technology that many of us working in technology policy have seen, which is that while technology is a social fact like any other, it, it, it has this uh, way of eluding legal analysis and policy analysis. Um, and so the first concept I wanna talk about is technological incapacity. So one of the things that I have noticed working in technology policy for all these years is that one of the qualities that technology has, emerging technology, is that it will pose as inevitable when in fact it is deeply contingent, right? So I don't mean that in the standard 
technological determinist way, although you certainly are welcome to, to think about it that way, nor in the sense of uh, technological, um, you know, autonomous technology, as, as Winner would say. Um, but I mean it in the sense that whatever the market yields up, that's what people think the technology is. They don't see the technology as a bundle of affordances. They don't see the technology as um, a, 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 a set of possibilities Rather, they see it as the car, the autonomous vehicle. And this has really interesting and sometimes unfortunate ramifications for the law. And so, for example, I don't expect you to read a lot of this text, but I just want you to see that there's blue and there's red, right? <laughs> so in Nevada, Nevada passes this pioneering, good to see you, this pioneering um, uh, uh, a driverless car law, right? The first in the nation. And because Google came to them and said, we're going to make driverless cars and you, Nevada, could be uh, really innovative and capture all that. You could be the state for autonomous vehicles. And they're like, that sounds great. So they passed this pioneering law. Uh, it, it sails through the legislature, gets signed by the governor. And then all of a sudden, people start coming out of the woodwork who work on technology that are not Google. And they start to say, wait a second, wait a second. The way that you've defined this technology um, it seems like it would capture uh, uh, cars that we, Lexus or BMW or whatever, already have on the road, mm -hmm. right? And so because of the fact that we have adaptive cruise control or self-parking, do we have to put up a million-dollar bond for each vehicle and have a special license plate with a thing on it and do all this kind of testing? And the legislature's like, well, no, no, that's not what we meant. And they're like, well, that's literally what the law says, right? So within a year of Nevada passing this pioneering artificial intelligence driverless car law, they end up having to <laughs> having to repeal it and then write a new version of it. Why? Because they only listened to Google and they only thought that this technology Google was showing them was what driverless cars was. When in fact, there was a different range. If that doesn't convince you, I'll give you another example from, from robotics. Maybe people have seen these little Starship uh, delivery things. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have them at, here at Princeton? Um, we, we don't have them at the University of Washington. Uh, there's too much rain. <laughs> um, but these little things, you can see what they look like. They weigh about 96 pounds. They have six wheels, blah, 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 right? And Starship went around being like, you know what? City, campus, whatever of the future, you know, you could have this technology. You could have these really cool, uh, imagine that someone's doing a tour of your campus and they're thinking about whether to go to Princeton uh, instead of some other uh, nameless uh, school that I won't uh, I won't mention. Um, and 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 they see this 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 robot delivery thing going around. Isn't that so cool? Or they go to the they go to the city or they go to the state, right? What happens? Well, the states write laws saying, okay, autonomous delivery. I guess is like when you take a when you take a robot that has six wheels mm -hmm. and these kinds of sensors and weighs this much, right? And then all of a sudden people are like, wait a second, wait a second, what about drone delivery? What about biped delivery? What about this? What about that? Right? But at this point, they have already used this political capital and they've enshrined the instance of technology that the market yielded to them, right? And this is a major issue. Okay. A second aspect of technological incapacity, and I'm sorry, this is a bit uh, uh, of, a, of a severe uh, severe set of slides you're about to see, but um, is the idea that technology makes a shell game of human responsibility. And this mm. is also something that people in STS know very, very, very well. The idea that technology will embed choices and visions and channel your behavior, but not in a way that's readily perceptible necessarily to the consumer or the citizen. If you want to think about the power of design, my favorite way to imagine it is to look at January 6th, <clears throat> where folks were literally scaling walls, all right, breaking windows. But then when they got into the Capitol, they followed those velvet ropes <laughs> and they didn't stray. <laughs> Right? That's how powerful design is. Um, and so we know this in law. Uh, we have all read uh, that, that code is law, you know, code and other laws of cyberspace or code 2.0 by Lawrence Lessig. But if you read anything in law and technology, maybe this is what you read. And so we, we know that. Um, we know that you can, that you can do that. Um, and nevertheless, we are having such a difficult time. And when I say we, I mean the tech policy community broadly, but 
not to suggest it's homogeneous. Some folks are on this, <laughs> other people are not, but like say a state legislature or a, or a federal lawmaker are still, are still making the mistake of misattributing where the liability is supposed mm -hmm. to go. So while you do have situations like recently where Air Canada's chatbot told people that the bereavement fair was retroactive after having a lengthy chat with a consumer and a court said, I'm sorry, Air Canada, that's your policy now because your apparent agent told somebody that the bereavement leave was in it. There's a screenshots of it, so you're gonna pay. Well, that happens every once in a while and makes national international news. The more common thing is this, despite the fact that the Department of Transportation did a detailed report and showed that there was lax security culture at Uber around their driverless cars experiments in Arizona and found that they had shut off technology on the Volvo that would have saved this pedestrian's life and set the thresholds incorrectly um, at, at the points that were not um, uh, crossing points, um, thereby showing on the, on the, it's really awful, but if you look at the sensor data, you actually see this poor woman crossing the street and the, and the, uh, and the car ignoring it. Nevertheless, they decided to charge, they being Arizona, decided to charge criminally this poor woman who was supposed to be attending to a car that drives itself right? She's charged criminally. And in fact, if you look at the work of David Vladek, for example, at Georgetown, you can see time and again that courts will look for the person to blame who was there instead of the people that designed the system. It makes a shell game of responsibility, okay? So for example, there's one case where a bunch of things were wrong with a plane uh, that crashed, but one of them was very obviously that there was a problem with the, the, the autonomous uh, pilot mode, okay? But they couldn't figure it out. So they also noted that the plane had been misloaded, like it had been loaded improperly by people, and they decided to blame it on that rather than on the manufacturer, okay? Um, all right. And then um, last but not least, I love this paper so much. I'm going to talk about two papers that I love so much, but this one, this is one of um, Leo Marx's um, The Emergence of a Hazardous Concept. Um, the last thing I want to say about technology and technological incapacity is that as a social fact, it gives off this veneer of unregulability. Like it, people think that you can't regulate technology or you shouldn't. Um, and when Marx talks about technology being a hazardous concept. He doesn't mean like literally like asbestos. He means there's some hazard in investing in this technological sublime. And you know, I mean, I'll, I'll go back a couple of slides, but look at look at this technology, what it looks like. You know, look what it looks like. It just gives off this feeling of, you know, trust and and, and futurism and all this other stuff. And it's it's clean lines and it's, you know, it's this technology, it's packaged in a way. And so he talks about how technology gets away with a lot, misleads us due to it's it's just the feelings that it invokes in us, right? Um, but I want to talk a little bit more deeply about about the idea of um the calling ridge dilemma or the idea of the pacing problem. So one of the chief ways that law ends up not fatalistically not addressing technology when it should, right, has to do with this widespread belief that David Coleridge all those years ago was right and that the regulator is in a double bind, an information bind and a power bind. The information bind is, and this, by the way, is backed up by STS, alas, I'll get back to that in a moment, but it, the idea is you can't fully know what technology will do in society until you have a chance to like write three case studies about it. You know what I mean? Until you have a chance to like watch it play out. You don't know because technology doesn't do any one specific thing, definitely. It's just however we interact with it, our culture, our society, that is how technology ends up. You know, so we don't know what the benefits will be fully. We don't know what the harms will be fully. And so Anytime we went to intervene at the outset, invoke the precautionary principle, we're gonna mess it up. We're gonna mess it up. But then Coleman says, unfortunately, when we let technology play out long enough, all of a sudden people get invested in it. There's money at stake, there's lobbyists, right? You know, I don't know how Uber is gonna affect this city. I shouldn't do anything. 
oh my God, now Uber has a lot of lobbyists and a lot of people like using Uber and they want to pay less for, you know, you know what I mean? And the convenience of the app, all of a sudden it begins very different. That's the power bind. So you have an information bind and a power bind. And using sort of magic of libertarian calculus, this becomes the pacing problem. The idea that inevitably technology is always going to outpace the law. And it creates this perception that uh, we're, we're, we're impotent as against uh, channeling technology, right? And it's part of the reason that we abandoned the paradigm of technology assessment in the 1990s, which was operating within the United States um, uh, until that time with the OTA and so on. So, okay. so um, this is my other favorite paper. Morgan's mm -hmm. paper is brilliant. She's just brilliant. Um, so this paper is about, um, th do, you, do you guys know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, of course you do. Of course you do. Of course you do. Yeah, it's a ahead. terrific paper. So the flip side of the idea that um, you can't, you know, there's there's a lot of other stuff going on here too. So if you look at the AI debates, the reason we shouldn't regulate AI too heavily is because, you know, it, we can't catch up to it. It's moving too fast by the time we intervene, whatever. But also there's the geopolitics of it. We can't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. We can't, uh, uh, we, we, we can't let our rivals in other nations be at the forefront of this technology. So there's a lot going on, right? But one of the flip sides of this, or one of the aspects of this that I find okay. so remarkable is that when technology doesn't do what it's supposed to, it gets a total pass. Like nobody ever really goes back and rolls up their sleeves and said, did that work? Except for people like Ames, <laughs> who goes back and looks at the one laptop per child, miserable failure, and the wasted money, the wasted political capital, the wasted attention, you know what I mean? And says, this didn't work. There were reasons to know it wasn't gonna work in the first place. We don't do this. And my big example with this, and totally apologies if this is something that you worked on, because a lot of people did. So I might say something that you don't like right now, and I'm sorry. I'm going to take a sip of coffee <laughs> while you guys prepare my, my to say that. <laughs> Contact tracing apps did not work. <laughs> they didn't work, OK? And when, and when OMB came in and did like an assessment of, hey, I wonder if contract tracing work, worked, they, they were like, well, they totally didn't work at all. But maybe it's because people were afraid of them. Do you know what I mean? Um, no, it just, it never was gonna work. That's not what Bluetooth is for, right? It just didn't do what it was supposed to do, but nobody really talks about it. Though we invested millions of dollars, a lot of attention and so on. I'm sorry for those of you who worked on it. Hope that you, uh, maybe you'll disagree and you can tell me so. Okay, so then what's the role of, of, of law in all of this? I've talked about the idea that that, that technology has this spell it casts on us and there's this technological incapacity that we share um that we i see it across different cultures i see it across different communities to different extents what is the law supposed to do about it well you know the idea that code is a form of law or that there's hidden will in technology and architecture all of the law people learned about that through people like Lawrence Lessig or Joel Reidenberg, who visited here and, and wrote Lex Informatica was an incredibly important prior work. Um, we learned about it from Joel and, and Larry, right? But we could have learned about it hmm. 10 years before from Latour, mm -hmm. uh, where he talked about the way that when social norms run out, you use architecture. And when people won't return your key and they go and they're gonna walk around and lose it in Paris, you make the key super big so it's inconvenient. We learned about it 10 years prior to that when people thought, when Winter talked about whether artifacts have politics, right? And in 1954 and in 1960s, we have not just STS, but we have uh, the a philosophy of technology, which has a very long uh, history. The problem concerning technology, of course, tactics and civilization, the technological society, um, so many. I mean, one of my favorite, um, uh, one of my favorite favorite books of, of all time is The Convivial Society, and I just highly, highly recommend that book. It's just so good. Um, I should have put it on the slide, but in any event, um, a lot of people have been thinking about these issues of, of what law does for a super long time, right? Coling Ridge is, is decades ago as well. So um, leave it to them or 
wholesale import the insights from STS and philosophy of technology and so on just into law and just proceed apace? What is law? What's special about law? Why write a book about law and technology? Why not just write a, a you know a version of my the scale in the reactor and just be like I'm, I'm done? You know what I mean? And there's two things, two things about law as a field that I want to put forward to you as being um, uh, really important. And the two things are, number one, we are super comfortable with normativity. And number two, we are deeply pragmatic. Okay, super comfortable with normativity, deeply pragmatic. Pragmatic. Law professors don't just want to tell you what's wrong. They want to tell you what you ought to do about it. What you ought to do about it. What should I do about it? Right? Um, that's expected. Like, we have a shorthand for papers that's like part three, which is the normative part. We tell you what you ought to do about it. This comes from custom, community, habit, whatever, but it also comes from a sense in the law that like, you know, to paraphrase um, Max Weber, like law has this uh, uh, monopoly on the <laughs> legitimate use of force, of coercion. You have people like, um, Dworkin are one of our sort of famous juris, jurisprudential um, uh, giants, uh, Ronald Dworkin, talking about how to interpret the law, you need to understand what the best political moral theory is, because if you're going to justify coercion, you should have a normative argument about it. You can't justify coercion, he argues, with pure positive law. How does that give you an authority and a justification to like um, take stuff away from people and imprison them and even kill them, right? So... Um, another great quote that I love from Robert Covers, uh, Violence in the Word, he starts off that article and he says, legal interpretation takes place on the field of pain and death, which is very dramatic. But you see where he's going, right? The idea is that you take stuff away from people. You hurt them. You, you, you bind them. So if you're going to be telling folks what you ought to do in an environment like that, maybe you need to truck in normativity. And so outside of political moral philosophy, we are deeply comfortable with should in a way that I think a lot of other disciplines just are not. They're like, I'm not trying to tell you like anything moral about these sea scallops or whatever. You know what I mean? Like these bicycles. I'm just telling you what happened. I studied it really closely. So, you know, STS, I love it because it's such beautiful music, but can you dance to it? Right. And so the second thing is the, is the fact that we are deeply relent as Julie Cohen, who has definitely spoken here like 30 times has mm. said, we're, we're relentlessly pragmatic, meaning at the end of the day, we want to solve problems. We want to we, we want to architect, you know, society. I was once on a panel with uh, some engineers and this guy turned to me and he said, you know, you lawyers like, you know, what do you know about this? Like you don't build you don't build anything, you know, like you don't. How, how do you know about this? You don't build anything. And I'm like. Uh, I'm sorry, we built a rule of law. You're welcome. To that. <laughs> anyway, so the point of the matter is, is that you know, we're really pragmatic. And this comes out of American pragmatism as a tradition. I mean, literally, Pierce and Dewey and all those folks uh, were, at the turn of the century were hanging out with Oliver Wendell Holmes. You, you know what I mean? I mean, this the American lawyer and the American law professor are deeply, deeply pragmatic. And so we want to not only tell you what you ought to do, we want to tell you how to do it. Okay, so what, but by what means, right? And so the major contribution of the book is to set this stage, but then to talk about methodology, because something that drives me crazy about the American Legal Academy is nobody talks about method, hardly mm -hmm. ever, right? Some places do talk about method. So law and economics talks about method, law and literature, law and society, empirical legal studies, uh, critical race theory, and so on. They talk about methodology somewhat, and they, as a consequence, have an enormously outsized impact, right, on the rest of on the rest of jurisprudence. I mean, look at law and economics. Like, should a bunch of lawyers and judges really be like trying to figure out like what the highest value use is or know anything about economics at all, right? No, but it's such a powerful thing because you can just be like, oh, I'm I'm applying this economic lens and I'm trying to maximize utility in this way. Um, and so, you know, by virtue of having a method, they have an outsized impact. That's what I want for law and technology, because I think we do have a method. And even though the work seems to be all over the place, we tend to do the same thing over and over again. And I want to share what I think that is, but I also want to structure it and add some analytic rigor to it 
and make it look more like other disciplines will feel comfortable with it, right? Because a lot of other disciplines, first what happens is you're like, yeah, like, oh, I published this article with my PhD candidate in Columbia Law Review, and they're like, oh, that's really good. Columbia Law Review is so great. And, and they were just like, yeah, so like, do you know who your reviewers were? And I was like, oh, no, it's not peer reviewed. It's like students. And they're like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you just said that it wasn't peer reviewed and that students make the decisions yeah. about the journal. And I'm like, <laughs> no, literally, that is what happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's two it's second year law students who are making these decisions. OK, but also there isn't um, there in, in all fairness to Columbia and everybody everywhere else that it, they are actually starting to put structured peer review in place and Columbia does that for example but it's a relatively recent innovation but the second thing is a, a, is a lack of attention to methodology right it's just kind of we analyze stuff from a legal perspective and it's not necessarily methodology so um I tried to get uh I like to use Dolly for my slides because I think it's fun and so it's but I think it's hilarious what it's bad at and so I was just sort of like all right what I want Dolly is a chalkboard with the following written on it definition oh I misspelled that maybe that's why I was bad definition envisioning analysis and action and it's like okay I got you <laughs> I got you Actusian, astronaut, and we would, what, you know, this is what they decided to do. So I decided that I couldn't do that. And I need a little help from Bart Simpson. And so I'm going to talk about the four stages of my methodology uh, um, uh, uh, in turn, um, and then um, quickly try to turn it over to you guys for commentary and questions. Okay. How am I doing on time? Oh, surprisingly well. I guess I spoke fast. Um, the first crucial stage of legal analysis of emerging technology is definition, okay? Specifically, you need to define how this technology differs from previous and constituent technologies, right? What is augmented reality specifically? How does it differ from just a regular screen? How does it differ from virtual reality? What is essential about augmented reality as opposed to just contingent? So for example, augmented reality doesn't need to be in glasses. It could be in the dashboard of a vehicle. It could be through a, through a, a glass plate. You know what I mean? Um, there's lots of possibilities for augmented reality. Um, it could be a, a, a hologram, okay? That's not essential to augmented reality. The way that augmented reality differs from like, all previous displays back to cave drawings <laughs> is the idea that it is layering in new information in real time that can be that can be specific to the viewer and can change over time, right? So it's what is it that's essential about the technology? How does it differ from previous and constituent technologies? Surprisingly little law and technology work bothers to do this. And that's often how we run into the problem of just taking whatever happens to be yielded up by the market or the news as being this is this is this is autonomous transportation, this is driverless cars, this is augmented reality, right? Not sitting there and thinking carefully about what about it is contingent and what isn't. Um, and so, what is your actual target subject matter? I'm going through this. There, each of these things in the book has like a lot of sub steps and draws different kinds of literatures into it, obviously. So I'm doing a very overview version for purposes of this presentation. But the second exercise is envisioning, okay? I also like to call this affordance-based analysis. I think probably many of you are aware of theory of affordances, James Gibson, percept perceptual psychologist. There's been a lot of recent really great work in uh, affordance theory that's built it out um, quite substantially. Um, uh, and the idea is here, now that you understand what is essential about the technology, what's, what's in, for lack of a better word, new, how does it change human affordances and capabilities? What can people do that they couldn't do before? What do they do differently? What the, can they not do? How does it change human affordances? And to some extent, I use the word envisioning instead of forecasting or analysis because, you know, you do have to do some speculation. Um, and I talk about some of the tools that we have to speculate more wisely. Um, I also talk about the legal levers we might have to um, ensure that if we get technology wrong, um, then we have ways of correcting ourselves. One of the things I find so amazing mm -hmm. about libertarian critiques of the precautionary principle is the idea that they believe 
that if you, in, the, in a place like the United States, the options are to ban something entirely or just let it go. You know what I mean? Um, when in fact, we have a federalist system where, and, and, and federalism never comes up in precaution, in, 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 um, in, in uh, uh, libertarian critiques of precaution. But the idea is we just like, maybe Michigan does it one way, maybe New Jersey does it another way, maybe Washington does it a third way. And we start to see what happens, right? So like Margot Kaminsky has this great paper on drone federalism, talking about how if you're trying to reconcile privacy and free speech issues with safety, why don't you all let all the different states do it differently? We see what works and what doesn't, right? But in any event, the idea is you, you do have to bite the bullet. You do have to envision how does this change human affordances and what's problematic about that. We're doing that right now with generative AI, all of us probably. Um, okay. Once you've done these two very difficult tasks that I don't mean to minimize of, of getting a really good definition. Um, I often work with computer scientists and information scientists about getting that definition, doing um, for an affordance analysis and envisioning what it changes for human affordances. It is only at that stage that you can then move into analysis, legal analysis. And by legal analysis, I want to be clear that the thing that bothers me about contemporary law and technology is that the people rarely state their normative priors. So they tell you what you ought to do but they don't tell you where they're coming from. You know, they don't tell you like why, like what's your vision of human flourishing? Are you a capabilities person? Do you like you know, send a nuss bomb? Are you trying to maximize welfare of a certain kind? Are you uh, into virtue theory? What, what's your deal, right? Um, and, and they don't do it. They just say, you ought to do this. You should do this. And usually it's, there's some tacit cost benefit analysis kind of you know, a, 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 a welfare maximization thing going on here, but nobody says it outright. So one of the steps in analysis is saying, um, when you're in, analyzing this, from what perspective? What is your what is your um, reason? And then also, why are you selecting the area of law that you're selecting? I can't tell you how often I see a paper that just says, okay, this is going to be a analysis of the impact of augmented reality on contracting. Okay, why? Because you're a contract professor, why, right? What is it about the affordances of this technology that make it interesting for contracts specifically? You know what I mean? So a lot of this analysis is, is 101. It's what law, lawyers are comfortable doing all, already, what law professors and students are comfortable doing already. But what, what the sub-steps of my method re request is that you, you make explicit certain kinds of normative commitments and you talk about why you chose to analyze this technology in accordance to this uh, uh, doctrine, okay? Um, one chapter of the book is just applying the methodology to like a bunch of different areas like cochlear implants and gene editing and, 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 and AI and a bunch of other things just so you can see how it actually works out. Um, and that chapter is amazing and I haven't even written it yet, but it's gonna be so good. I can't <laughs> believe how good it is. It's gonna be so convincing. Um, and then finally, remember that pragmatism action, right? So why did you what why are you selecting a lever of power that you're selecting? What what at what scope do you want to do this? Do you want to do this internationally? Do you want to do it federally? Do you want to do it locally? Uh, why are we using the particular um, uh, levers that we're using is civil, uh, criminal? You're going to use rules, you're going to use standards, or you're going to have a sunset clause. Do you know what I mean? And so the idea is, like, let's talk about it. This is what we're supposed to do as law professors, right? We're supposed to like understand like how to get stuff done and the levers of power. So let's talk about that expressly. Because what happens instead is a person writes a whole long thing about how um, contracting, how augmented reality affects contracting. And then they tell you, and we should change this one rule about unconscionability at the end. You know what I mean? With no analysis of like, and saying that would improve things marginally, like no analysis of why are we using this particular bless you uh, tool, right? Okay, so um, again, for the sake of time, because I do want to have a discussion here, um, I will I will move on. I just want to say uh, in the end, so like, I am not anti-technology. And I think that it's tempting in this sort of tech lash for people to come in and say, you know, look, uh, uh, technology has these qualities and they're so messed up and they're causing us to move us astray and everything else. And like, I do think that technology has certain qualities and it is kind of messed up, but at the same time, like, I really believe in it. 
you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't do what I do, like be devote my whole life, like my whole career to like law and technology policy, like if I didn't really fundamentally believe in it. And so, you know, at the end of the book, in addition to talking about how to improve the tech policy ecosystem overall by um, uh, protecting whistleblowers, protecting researchers, adding, um, refunding the Office of Technology Assessment and all kinds of things that would improve the overall ecosystem in the United States, I talk about what's magical and wonderful. Like I love Spotify. You know what I mean? I, I think it's an amazing thing. I know it has its problems. Believe me, I, I don't think people are necessarily always paid fairly and they, there are some shenanigans on that platform. Nothing's perfect, but it's it's it dramatically improves my life. And there are many other examples of that, right? Um, but I just think that, you know, we've given up. Uh, as 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 a society and, and, and a set of policymakers and 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 lawyers and so on, um, we kind of throw our hands up in the air when it comes to technology. Unlike many other kinds of social facts, we talk about technology moving too fast. Like in a twelve-year period in the United States history, we banned alcohol by constitutional amendment, and then we unbanned alcohol by constitutional amendment. You know how hard that is. We did that in a few years. The technology example is. Um, Within seven years of the satellite, space satellite going up into orbit, we had the space treaty. You know, and it's just like with you know when we want as, as soon as Reagan and his and his uh, cabinet uh, watched um, war games with Matthew Broderick, uh, we immediately got the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, like that very year, right? You know, so we can move quickly and we can intervene. Um, and so, like, yeah, and, and I and I don't know. I mean, I, I, my my view is that we have just given over too much and that it's a, we need to demystify technology and get rigorous and methodical about its analysis. And that that will not only help improve law and technology and make it into more of a field of its own, but hopefully also will help our society get a handle and channel this technology in towards human flourishing. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna stop there because I wanna have a robust conversation. I don't know how we do the queue or whatever it is, Arvin, but um, you know, thank you for listening to my presentation. Yeah, we certainly have time for questions. Uh, it's pretty informal, just put up your hands. And... Uh, yeah, uh, Ryan, thank you so much for this talk. This was super interesting and I always appreciate a heavy dose of STS in uh, my lunchtime talks. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so I've been spending a bunch of time working on the current slate of child online safety legislation right now, like COSA and things like that. And obviously right now we have this TikTok ban that's being proposed. And a lot of my worry around tech regulation is that it often, as you said, like in response to like the War Games movie, it ends up getting sort of pushed through based on moral panics and a lack of empirical evidence. And I am not sure how to solve that problem. Because on one hand, I believe we should have more technological regulation and more good, well-informed tech policy. But on the other side, I feel like when we do get tech policy, it's usually bad. So how do you think through some of these issues? Yeah, I mean, so that is a astute observation and I completely agree with it. Oftentimes, you know, FOSTA sets as another example. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we do, we get this knee-jerk, terrible stuff. But like, it's almost by uh, design at this point. You know, my, my colleague, a, a lot of you probably know, one of my co-founders for the Tech Policy Lab is Batia Friedman, and she mm -hmm. is the, the best. Um, she's emeritus, makes me so sad every day when I think about it, but she's still involved and she's been a wonderful colleague. Anyway, she talks about how um, the irony of people saying, hey, we have this climate change problem. You know what we ought to do? We should put like sensors in coral reefs or, uh, we should put like, you know, put um, like uh, 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 cameras in the forest or whatever. And she says, enough already. We don't need to instrument nature anymore. The problem is one of political will. You know, we know that climate change is a problem and what we could do about it. We're, it's not, the problem is not, we don't have enough information, mm -hmm. right? So I do think there's a problem of political will where, mm -hmm. where people are just trying to respond to their constituents and they're doing so in a knee jerk way. But I will say that we had at one point a much more thoughtful paradigm, which was that of technology assessment, mm -hmm. right? The Office of Technology Assessment was founded in, in the 1970s at the same time as the Office of Science, Technology, Policy in the White House. OTA helped Congress. It had an interdisciplinary crew of people from academia and industry and elsewhere. Um, and it was defunded 
during the Gingrich Revolution in the 1990s, which is no coincidence. So it's on the books, but not funded, right? And so now we're trying to shore that up with OMB, OSTP, but those are those are executive um, uh, agencies with things like Tech Congress, which mm -hmm. I deeply believe in, and I love Tech Congress. It's awesome. My own Tech Policy Lab students, like electrical engineer um, Catherine Pratt, did it in the inaugural uh, class of it. It's awesome, but it's not enough, right? And so I do think one of the really key important things is going to be um, uh, to refund the Office of Technology Assessment um, and to to bring in that expertise like your your colleague um jonathan mayer being a department of justice is a huge win to me you know what i mean so i do think it's a situation where if we did have both that expertise distributed in government and and this is the hard thing the political will to actually like do things right you know mm -hmm. um, i mean the TikTok ban I'm so frustrated with the TikTok ban. I mean, you know, the, if you're telling me that the one, if, if you're going to have a huge bipartisan bill that obviously offends the Constitution, let's do gun regulation. Yeah. Not, you know what I mean? Not not trying to ban a platform that millions of Americans are using. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? It's like patently unconstitutional. And that's what they get their, their, their act together around. It's just disturbing. Um, but in any event, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful in the end that if, if we can go back to a, a careful paradigm of tech assessment, maybe led by Europe, and we can, you know, take certain other steps to improve the ecosystem, um, I think we could do a better job. But there's not, there's no substitute for political will. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, uh, uh, this is very interesting. I have a question about the second step, the envisioning step. Yeah. It seems like that's very hard. Um, and so if we were thinking, like to make a concrete example, open weight foundation models mm -hmm. is a big debate now. And like, how do you think we could realistically assess or envision the possible good and bad downstream uses, especially far into the future? And if there's so much uncertainty, is there, at what point do we say there's not even really a lot of value in trying to do that? Mm -hmm. So um, so in, in the book, um, I draw from a couple of different literatures that I've, I've written about in the past. One of them is a Fordance theory where, I mean, again, it grew out of perceptual psychology, but it's been, you know, deployed in design and robotics and lots of other, other spaces. Um, and uh, some of the vocabulary and the concepts of affordance theory, like negative and positive affordances and false affordances and so on, can be useful in trying to figure out just what this technology can can and can't do, right? Um, I also draw from some of the more robust forecasting methodology. I wrote a paper with a PhD candidate in information science about um, how to do more rigorous forecasting. But ultimately, you're never going to know 100% how it's going to play out, which is why you have to use legal tools that contemplate that. One of them is sunset provisions. Right. I mean, when when Congress passed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and particularly the anti-circumvention provision, they didn't know precisely um, what what people were going to do, how they're going to interact with digital rights management. Right. So they charged the Library of Congress to come up with a series of exemptions and to revisit them over time. And that's precisely what's happened. So the security exemption is one of them from the Library of Congress, because security researchers were trying to test out DRM and they were afraid of getting sued, you know? Um, federalism's helpful where you let lots of different things do it. But I mean, also things that are sort of contingent. You know, what's interesting to me is that a lot of the AI act in, as I read it, in uh, Europe is saying, hey, if this shit ever happened, you're gonna have to knock it off. They're not saying it's gonna happen. You know what I mean? They're saying that if it turns out that you are manipulating people based on their vulnerability, or you're trampling on human rights or whatever happens to be, we're gonna come, you know what I mean? Like not saying that's gonna happen, not saying how it's gonna happen, you know? And so so I just think we have to stop pretending like the law hasn't thought of contingency, you, you know what I mean? And so that that's my main response, um, which suggests, I hope, that these stages of analysis are interrelated, 
you, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, because I think you do need to be candid when you're doing envisioning, when you're like, we do not know. We do not know, you know, uh, what's going to happen we, with open waves. Uh, I, I don't know who the, the people were, but um, a lot of hands. Um, Janet, sure, and then Arvind, um, and then Rose. Sure. Um, thanks, this is great. I think SDF does make beautiful music. I think you can dance to it, but I like it. Yeah, yeah. No, we can talk I about like that at, uh, over here. Yeah. Um, so two comments about this that I'd love to hear you expand on. And it really comes back to the way you're talking about this kind of technological sublime, <laughs> which Latour is really into, right? Like the whole notion that you look at this object, and it looks like a standalone object. And what you've done is completely conflate all of the myriad connections that make it look like this one thing is acting when actually it can only act by virtue of these interconnectivities. So there's two elements to that then that I want to follow up on. One is the thing that's missing in this is the money, mm -hmm. right? Like one of the things about producing a technological <laughs> sublime is that this enables people to get fabulously wealthy through venture capital investment, um, but also to propose something to the market where they then get to do that shell game so their companies never bear the brunt, right? So the kind of uh, the financial arrangement, the corporate arrangement of different kinds of actors around whom like resources are flowing to support the notion of this singular technological supply would seem to be an important thing to also consider as you're thinking about law, yeah. right? Because in fact, there's been a number of laws as I understand that have been overturned recently about say limit limitations on how much founders can pull from their investments and so on, right? Like there's there's, something going on there that's also providing incentive. Yeah. The second thing is you should know that I have a vendetta against a foreign theory. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and I've written actively against it and I've had lots of conversations about this, but I think actually a foreign theory does precisely that sublime move of saying that these are properties that can accrue to objects as opposed to opening the black box that STS requires you to do and figure out how it is that such objects accrue the sensibility of the, the appearance of being able to act. Um, because one of the things that does make technology appear flexible or, uh, you know, the cat's out of the bag and there's just nothing we can do, we don't know how it's going to happen when it's in contact. We don't know what's going to happen when we put it into a context. Is that people take it up in a context that's actually entirely consistent with the local properties of use uh, and can be very flexible about how they then interpret and then use those technologies. Mm. They can be the same affordances that end up getting rescripted in different ways. So I'd be interested, that may be a longer conversation we have offline, but I did want to like take this notion of you explode the network and go against sublime sublimity. Yeah. And you want to explode the network precisely because that gives you legal traction on how and where to intervene to change the outcomes. And those would seem to be two things that you might want to consider that are components of the network that are really meaningful. Yeah, so I, I, I need to think about that more for sure. I mean, the, the, the one thing I didn't mention in the talk that is in the, the, the book um, is, is the idea that um, technology is constantly putting values um, in, in a state of defense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and, and that it becomes a kind of arbitrage where um, you're doing something with technology, you know, um, and 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 therefore you have just enough of veneer of, of plausibility that it's different that mm -hmm. you can persist in doing what hotels do or doing what uh, taxis do, but act like it's a technology, you know. Right, right. But the but the main thing is that there's these two um, there's several papers by Monroe Price, mm -hmm. some with John Duffy at UVA, that talk about if you actually look about what Congress and the courts do when confronted with a new technology, is they press their old agenda. Mm -hmm. Right. So technology becomes this idea. Technology's changed. Mm -hmm. And then the policymakers are like, ooh, everything's different. Maybe I can, you know, press my yeah. old yeah. timey agenda yeah. here. And so what they ended, yeah. they end it, he, they show it with he's a communication scholar, Monroe. So they show it with communications technology. But that's a very interesting thing too, which I think is implicated in all this. Yeah. On affordance theory, very quickly, because I feel like I need to defend affordance that's theory. Totally like, look, the, the, the original idea was in perceptual psychology was like, hey, is the world objective or is it subjective? You know what I mean? Like, is there anything like really out there, really? Because we all perceive it and we don't know, you know what I mean? And the idea was to try to bridge the perspective, the um, subjective and the object. The idea being that the material world is what it is, but we interpret it differently. We perceive it differently due to what it affords us, right? Mm -hmm. I see affordance theory as being that bridge to 
between the myriad complexity of uh, actor network theory or 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 um, uh, social construction of technology, what it happened to be, and like a real lived material experience world where things actually, you know what I mean? And so yeah. I see that as a deep tension in STS between the people on the one hand that said like Winner and Latour who say that that you know technology society made durable. Uh, uh, artifacts of politics, you know, uh, uh, human will is embedded in, in in these objects, and the people over here that say actually we have to be interpretive flexibility, and you know, you know what I mean, and like you never know, and whatever happens to be. I feel like affordance theory is this bridge for me, but I, I'm gonna have to read what you wrote about it. It yeah, sounds like maybe I I'm think one way to think about it is all of those theories are circulating around the question of structure versus agency, right? Mm -hmm. And for the technology space, it becomes a materiality versus like human uh, engagement interpretation, but they really are about that duality and the kind of interpretive flexibility in social construction technology doesn't mean there's nothing there. It just means that what's there is what has been collectively like uh, built, built into material form. And so the things that are there invite opening up to understand how they ended up acquiring the certain kinds of properties they have. Mm. So it could be helpful to think about these things as like, they, you can be more or less pragmatic with any of these tools. It's just how it articulates these relationships between the individual interpretation and the structures. Yeah. But let's talk more. Yeah, I know you okay. have to, I know you have to teach. I mean, I don't know, I was very influenced by like, uh, opening the black box and finding it empty or has critique right. run out of steam mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i want to talk about about the winner and latour's subsequent positions where they're a little bit skeptical of anyway um yeah, yeah we'll talk about it tonight i think i had arvin and then rose um sure thank you ryan that was really fascinating i'm going to take this in a super practical direction yeah so you said there's a method here's my four-step framework and i was thinking this is awesome i, I want to learn this i want to apply this framework so that next time I step my toes into policy, I feel less like I'm flailing around in the dark. Mm -hmm. Like I want to read a book on definition, you know, and I want to learn how to do that. Um, and this comes up all the time. Just last week, I was telling a staffer, similar to the things you were alluding to, no, your definition of Gen AI doesn't work. It includes Photoshop. Mm -hmm. but, I also, yeah. but I also know that I don't have the competence to write a better definition. So where can I go to get that? Are you saying this already exists or are you proposing that this be written down? Is your book the source? I was a little unclear on that. Yeah, so my, so um, it comes from the practice that you and I both have had over the years of, of, of talking through the technology with the people that do it. In your case, you are, are the people that do it. But like, you th but a lot of it is just about understanding, I'm sorry in, in advance, but understanding new technologies as bundles of affordance, right? One of the big issues I, I testified before the U.S. Senate about drones in the early days of drone surveillance, right? And they could not, they could not get, uh, uh, um, they could not get away from. Um, good to see you. I'll see you soon. Now. Sorry, <laughs> no, no, I know you had to go. Um, um, but they could not get. When, when I testified on on the table, the the drone, um, you know, the unmanned aerial systems people, like literally, like put a drone there. Do you know what I mean? Like a quadricopter. It was like this big. It was sitting there. And, we, and we're all sitting there looking at it, right? And they could not understand the idea that the real problem was mobile surveillance or aerial surveillance and that it could take many different forms. You know, what, what HRI community would call morphologies, right? Um, and so all the legislation that was passed defined drone in accordance to whatever the FAA had said as fixed wing or quadricopter right and then all these state laws arose about drone privacy when there are robots that can climb the side of buildings or there are balloons or there's there's robots that police have that they throw up a ball into the air and it takes high definition 360 degree you know things of a protest you know what i mean unregulated by these drone laws when what they were trying to get at was aerial and mobile surveillance one um one legislator i think it was um Leahy, wrote um uh, wrote a, a, a mobile aerial surveillance, but the idea is, you know, it's 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 a it's a practice that you that you um, cultivate from understanding technology as being a bundle of affordances that can that can change what people can do. You know what I mean? Um, but I try to give some guidance in the paper, uh, in the in the book, um, and I'd love to just send you that part of it and see what do you find it satisfactory. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, Rose. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned how 
we we do respond. There can be a fast response to certain technologies and versions. Um, but my question is, how do you balance between what's too fast without considering additional affordances versus what is too slow and then people are harmed? And I'm I'm thinking about your socio digital vulnerability paper um, with Steve Paola. Um, and so, how would you suggest that a balance is struck between a law that is created to protect this population, but actually harms another vulnerable population yeah. in the same law? Um, how many you know case affordances or exceptions should be written into these laws? How open ended it should it be in respect to that dynamic? Yeah. Um, so. A, a couple things a, a, about this. Um, I don't think it's an easy thing to do, right? I just don't think it's unique to technology, right? In all the president's men, do, do you all know that book? That book. Um, there's this. There's this. Uh, uh, at one point, there's this quote um, where Will. What's the name of that character? Is it Will Willie Starks? Do you guys remember the name of the character? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I thought maybe Princeton, you guys would know this, but you know, I'm just kidding. Um, but there's this character, right, who's a lawyer in in in, in all the president's um, men, and he says, uh, you know, that um, law is like is like a pair of pants for a growing boy. You know what I mean? The the minute that you know, the minute that you you put it on, it's too it's it doesn't fit. You know, it, it, the truth of the matter is, is that. Yeah, sometimes society is complicated and moves too fast. And that's why we need to have a number of different tools in our toolkit, including things like standards instead of rules. You know, I mean, the reason that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act held up all these years since the mid 80s with um, with uh, Matthew Broderick is because it defined hacking as unauthorized access to a protected computer, right? Or access exceeding authorization. And until adversarial machine learning, I would argue that it held up relatively well. Similarly, the Federal Trade Commission has been able to police a lot of different activities under the rubric of unfair and deceptive practice. Um, similarly, the AI Act is written in a way that is, so I think, I think we may end up, I think there's a really interesting empirical question about whether we wind up more often <laughs> with standards when regulating technology than rules which could be, you know, could be. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that's different. I mean, if you think about some of the dizzying social changes that occurred in our history, I mean, remember in World War II, right, um, all this legislation was passed to uh, empower women to enter the workforce, like desperate legislation, like all this stuff, opening doors, changing standards so that many, many women can enter the, the labor force. Four or five years later, a bunch of bills were passed to kick them all out and restore those jobs to the returning soldiers, right? We went from progressive to regressive again in a very short period of time. Sometimes social change is, is dizzying. I'm just trying to um, push back against the perception that this is somehow unique or uniquely problematic with technology. We'll be, oh, yeah. do we have time for one more? Um, or, yeah, let's yeah. take one more. Okay. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Ryan, for the great talk. So I wanted to uh, ask about something that you were saying at the start. So I work in robotics and specifically I work on safety guarantees for robotic systems and autonomous systems that can deploy uh, out in the world and trying to people and so on. And uh, in the in the experiences that I've had, I've worked at Waymo for a year before coming to Princeton. And I've been tracking with people in the autonomous driving industry, the drone industry, and so on. Mm. A sense that I get that makes me very uncomfortable is that there are that, you know, there are people in positions of uh, power and visibility that are very actively trying to steer the public conversation towards um, this idea that I think relates to the, oh, we can't know how to interact, but this idea that, oh, we cannot give safety assurances for these technologies. It's mm -hmm. just not possible. The best we can do is, you know, look at the numbers and say, oh, well, you know, according to our internal data, which, by the way, we may or may not share with you, our technology is safer than um, a, what we consider to be an equivalent human driver uh, you know, uh, driving this car. Mm -hmm. um, or it's safer than, I don't know, what the baseline they go into soon for a drive. And 
my my sense is that to some extent, then the public and also policymakers are sort of defenseless in the sense that these people are sort of rigging the game because they're trying to turn it into a into sort of into a technical problem, into a technological impossibility that I would argue is at the very least questionable. Um, and my sense is that something similar happened a little. This is outside of my area of expertise with you know Europe's GDPR when it came out, and a lot of people in machine learning were like, oh, "Are we? You know, we don't know how to do this. This is not this is not technically feasible. What you're asking us to do." Mm -hmm. And then it turned out, as far as I can tell, that a lot of the things at least were possible. It's just that you know, uh, once there was a law that forced uh, companies to put these measures into place, and it was possible. So I wonder how you think about the. So the the importance of um you know working against this narrative or what we can do you know, what can we do for example as uh, researchers on the technical side to to help uh fight these narratives these sort of you know, technical bullying narratives that are i think obfuscating the discussion and people are sort of not able to even you know have a conversation with the right vocabulary yeah, so two things, right? So I think this is an example of that first technological incapacity where things pretend that they're inevitable when in fact they're contingent, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, even in sort of the patent law literature, there is this concept of pat patenting around. So the idea is that if you patent something, uh, a way to uh, uh, treat um, emissions from a dry cleaner in order to be safer for the environment or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you patent that thing and everybody says, oh no, we need to get a license to that. We need to get a license to that to that thing because otherwise we're not going to be able to, to make our um, our own dry cleaners uh, 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 comply with this rule, right? And then, But then the government says, no, find your own way to do it. And then lo and behold, all of a sudden, all this creative patents emerge doing it a different way, right? I mean, it's this old idea of uh, necessity being the mother of invention, right? And so even in the patent literature, there's a conversation about how restricting people's ability to do things technologically leads to, to, to other possibilities, right? Um, in the early days of the internet, uh, people made these arguments that were so effective. So what would happen would be that like you'd have like, um, Craigslist or Backpage or MySpace or whatever it was, right? You'd have all these different things and the police would come and say, hey, uh, there's a bunch of drug dealing on your uh, site and human trafficking and there's about hate speech and all this different stuff. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they're like, well, you know, there's not really much we can do about that. And they're like, well, wait a second, wait a second. If this were a hotel and these things were happening in a hotel, well, then you, if you knew about them, you'd be responsible for them. That's how the law is. And the companies come back and go, yeah, but you got to imagine a hotel with, you know, hundreds of millions of rooms. And the lawmakers were like, well, that's a really good point. You know what I mean? But <laughs> in, 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 in retrospect, we're like, you built a freaking hotel with hundreds of millions of rooms? Like, is that a responsible thing to do? Do you know what I mean? And so, you know, there, 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 were, these, there were these moments when we just take as accepted gospel that this is how the architecture has to be. This is how the business model has to be. But at the end of the day, like, you know, it's up to the law and society what these things are. And lo and behold, the times we have intervened, you know, we haven't gone back to the Stone Age or or, or um, be, be taken over by a rival nation or whatever it is. You know what I mean? And so I, 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 I'm, I'm heartened to hear that you see this phenomenon in robotics. And I'm heartened because it, it positions people like you to push back against it, you know? Great. Uh, let's end the formal part of the talk. You're just going to cry. Thanks, everybody.